Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided, this threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union, the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome, Access to Democracy returns, and I'm really pleased to have a return guest with us today who is not only a veteran of the Minnesota Senate, but he's also a leader of the Senate and in many, many respects, the conscience of the Senate, Senator John Marty. And John, welcome back. Glad to be with you today. Yeah, it's really, we have so much to talk about that we can't get it in in a half an hour, but uh, let's, start, well, Let's start with one thing I didn't know. I didn't know that your father was an author, a minister, a theologian, and very close associate with Martin Luther King. Yeah, my dad has done and still continues to do some. He's um, slowed down in recent years, in mid 80s, but um, he's written 55 books or so. And yeah, as a little kid, I met Martin Luther 55 King. 55 books? Him. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I just got my second one coming out next month. I, I, have to I write really a paragraph for every book he writes, but yeah. A, and uh, and you've been in the Senate for since 1986. That's correct. So and so one of the most senior members. I think of myself as one of the young folks in the Senate, but um, I've been there a longer time now. So. Well, your thinking is young. I uh, I like to think of that as the case. Yeah. We need to we need to do things differently than the way we've been doing them, and I think our society's been so. Our political system's been lacking in vision of how we address our problems. And particularly, the legislature in this state in the last two years uh, has been a, frankly, a do-nothing <laughs> legislature. And what they have done really is antagonistic right, to, right. I, I, as I see it, uh, constitutional uh, yeah. mandates. But let's talk about something that happened two days ago. Uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals came down with a decision and I know you've already commented on it uh, online. Uh, talk, talk about that decision sure. a little bit. When the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, a couple of years ago came down with the Citizens United ruling, basically they opened the floodgates. I, I think we've had too much big money, too much corporate money in politics in the past. This basically made it no holds barred. And the Supreme Court at that time, though, they did say, well, it's important. You know, all this money should be in the political system. But at least the voters will be able to determine who's putting the money in because there will be perfect, there will be good disclosure of this. That's certainly allowed. Well, ever since then, the rulings have been going against disclosure. And Minnesota legislature passed a bipartisan bill that would provide some of this disclosure that um, when corporations are going to be putting money into the political process and the Eighth Circuit um, ruling based on what they read Citizens United is saying basically is taking away that disclosure that we've tried to get. So in effect, they, they've gutted, they've emaciated all of our, um, all of what we had for campaign finance laws and now they're picking up the last few pieces and getting rid of them as well. Well, you were quoted as saying they exactly got it backwards. And uh, you know, I think that's the situation. It was a very close decision. It was mm -hmm. a 6-5 decision of the full Eighth Circuit. But one of the things that the dissenting one of the dissenting judges uh, pointed out that Citizens United did not say anything about doing away with public disclosure. Right. What it did is 
opened really uh, the floodgates for corporate money. It opened the, the situation so that in the presidential race right now, we have a situation where 10 billionaires mm -hmm. can control possibly what happens in this election right. as opposed to 350 million Americans. Yeah, I, I think if you look back to the nation's founders, the founding fathers, I think they'd be horrified if they saw what was going on that what we're calling a democracy. I mean, it's become the point where money matters much more than anything else. And that's an oligarchy. Yeah, it's absolutely the type of thing that was the cause of our nation's revolution about the oligarchy who ruled things in, in the British system. I mean, we wanted a democracy where the ordinary people could have a say. And yeah, they have a say, they'll say, but you know, they're trying to take away people's rights to vote and at the same time they're making it so the money rules everything. The thing I'd say the courts have gotten most backwards is not the importance of the First Amendment. I like to quote what the Supreme Court said on the importance of the First Amendment in one of their campaign finance rulings, the key one of 30 some years ago. And that is the point of the First Amendment is to make sure we have the most widely diverse points of view out there and so the voters can weigh all in the marketplace of ideas, could weigh all the options and make the choices that are desirable to the future of the Republic. That's exactly the point of the First Amendment. The part where the courts have gotten exactly <clears throat> wrong is saying money equals free speech. And in this case, corporations are people. And in both of those cases... I like what Bill Moyer said, by the way. Go ahead, yes. Uh, he, he said that uh, when a corporation has a baby, he'll believe that they are people. <laughs> so. He's right. Um, I think I also heard him say when Texas executes one of them, then he'll believe they're yeah, people too. Yeah, that was but something I, else. But also, um, right. yeah, no, he um, he nailed it. But the the trouble is, money in politics does not give more perspectives out there. It means the people with the power just have the more they have. They already had the megaphone compared to somebody else's whisper. Now they'd be able to put a muffler on everybody else and just drown it all out with more of these 30-second soundbite TV ads, all attack ads. I mean, it seems to be more and more are just smearing the other candidate. And you can't say that this is a democracy the way it's happening. Um, I like to say that what happens on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, it's supposed to be an election, but it's turning into an auction. And those who give what the people with the money want. That's, that's a good Get analogy it. because, uh, and, and it's so antagonistic to everything that the Constitution stands for, that we stand for. Uh, we are facing even two amendments. Right. Amendments that became amendments only because laws passed the legislature, the governor vetoed the laws, uh, the Republicans did not have enough votes to override the vetoes. So now we have a voter ID amendment, which is doing far better than I could ever have imagined, mm -hmm. according to the polls, and a, a marriage amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, neither know, of those you things. You know, with, with the constitutions are meant to give people rights. I mean, that's the thing that the... the U.S. Constitution, the immediately after passage, because one of the faults of it was it didn't provide a Bill of Rights. So they added that immediately afterwards to make sure people were protected from, their rights were protected from government or anybody else stepping on them. The only time I can think of either in the state or the federal level where we've amended the Constitution to take away rights was a mistake. People admitted it was prohibition. We repealed it a few years later. Here now in one year they're trying to add two amendments to the Minnesota Constitution, both of which intrude on individual rights. And this is from the Republicans who say individual rights are key to them. I mean, this is one where the government is going to And tell they want to keep government out yeah. of individual life. Except for when they want to put it more intrusive than ever. Except when yeah. they want to control a woman's body. Right. Except when they want to control whether two gays can marry, right, right. Uh, which... To I me, can't think of anybody who feels right. threatened with that, uh, right. nor does it say anything other than these people should have equal rights right. also. And, and to me, I mean, with the marriage thing, I mean, the best example of that is, you know, I don't want 
any church to be told who they can or cannot marry. Right now, we tell a lot of churches they cannot marry loving couples that they want to marry. Um, I don't think the Catholic Church should ever be forced to marry a same-sex couple. I mean, of course, a lot of churches, the Jerry Falwells of the world in the 1960s, vowed when the Supreme Court forced states to repeal their bans on interracial marriage, a lot of those right-wing churches said, oh, we're never going to marry an interracial couple. It's unbiblical. It's, it's anti our belief. Well, 40 years later, things have changed, and I don't know any churches that wouldn't marry an interracial couple. But, you know, in this, they are taking away rights. They're trying to lock that into the Constitution. And the other one, the, the voter, they call it ID one, but it's basically voter suppression. Um, there was As a, I said before we went on, it's a poll tax. Yeah. It nationally, really is. Nationally, there was a study, a nonprofit went around, contacted every election official they could in the entire country. Give us all the examples of fraud you've had. And they're actually relatively small, very small number of fraud cases. But the kind, the only kind of fraud that this photo identification would prevent is voter impersonation. Wouldn't stop felons from voting, which is the main one, because your driver's license doesn't show your felony status. It wouldn't stop non-citizens from voting because your driver's license, non-citizens have a right to have driver's licenses. So it wouldn't stop any of that. The only thing it would do would be me pretending to be Alan and going and voting in your place. It would stop that from happening. How many times has that happened? This national nonprofit calculated 10 incidents they could track down in the last decade, in the last 12 years nationally. And that that's over hundreds of millions hundreds of votes. Hundreds of millions of people. In Minnesota, that's the equivalent of <clears throat> one voter every five decades. We could prevent one voter fraud case every five decades with this thing that's going to cost 30, 40, 50 million dollars on, and then ongoing costs as well. And um, that will take away the rights. I cannot believe if this constitutional amendment passes, I don't see how anybody could vote absentee except by going into your local city hall and voting in advance. And what about the members military? in the military? The military, yeah. I mean, what the courts have said, the Minnesota Supreme Court, in its ruling on saying that this is allowed to be on the ballot, it is not a, it's not misstated too much because it says no voter can vote without showing a photo ID. And then, well, what about absentee voters? Well, the courts determined that they would have to have virtually identical, that's the terms they use, virtually identical level of verification. And that's one thing, if you are going to be gone from your precinct um, on election day and you go into city hall a few days before it's another thing if the election judge is in st paul your precinct is in st paul and you happen to be in a remote outpost in afghanistan there's no way they can verify that military voters they couldn't vote under this that's unconstitutional seniors in nursing homes only way they could vote sure. is if if one of their kids or somebody takes them i mean some of them have catheters and have um, blood things into their arms all the time. You have to drag them out of the nursing home, take them to the deputy registrar's office, get them a new photo ID so they can vote. I mean, that's bizarre. Or bring a registrar to each nursing home at but millions they, of dollars but in they would cost. Still, not only that, but in order to bring the registrar there, you'd have to still be able to find the birth certificate and everything else. What about and these people that. that were born on farms yeah. where they had midwives? They never had a birth certificate. Right. I, I heard exactly. one woman saying she has voted for 79 years. Yeah. She was 90, yeah. I don't know, or maybe she had voted uh, whatever it was, close to that. And she had no birth certificate. Yeah. Everybody in the community knows her. Yeah. She's lived on this farm all her life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We're taking away we, her we right to vote, to say nothing of students. Yeah. Students, under the bill they passed last year, the one the governor vetoed, it spells mm -hmm. out what they want to do. No student ID, no military ID, only a current driver's license or the non-driver state ID card. And that means if a student comes from Thief River Falls, is on campus at Mankato State or University of Minnesota or something, if they want to vote, assuming they're not going to skip classes for a few days to head up to Thief River Falls to vote, the only way they could vote would be to get a driver's license at their dorm. They're going to live at their dorm for nine months, and we got to make them pay the 30 bucks for their driver's license just so they can vote? I mean, that's nuts. Then there's Texas. Texas said that a college ID is not valid 
for voting. Mm -hmm. You have to have two things, either a driver's license or an NRA license. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> In Pennsylvania, they said that students uh, could vote, but they had to have the year of their graduation on their IDs. Most of the colleges in Pennsylvania did not have that. Mm -hmm. They got together and they figured out a way to put stickers on the IDs to show the year of graduation. The registrar of Pennsylvania voters said, oh no, the stickers aren't good. It has to be actually part of the ID itself. Mm -hmm. Clearly an attempt just to keep people away from the polls. People who they are afraid would be more inclined to vote Democrat than yeah. Republican. And, and Alan, you know, a hundred years ago, women finally got the right to vote. Fifty years ago in the Civil Rights Movement Voting Rights Act, African Americans finally got the right to vote. And this is the first time, and it's a national trend, Minnesota just happened, our, our proposal here in Minnesota is the worst of them. I, I do not think there's a state that would be more restrictive than this, which is why my hope is that it's voted down. If it's not voted down, we better be in federal court immediately. Say, I mean, what about people in the military? They're serving our country. Can't they vote? I was, homeless people? I was hopeful mm -hmm. that the Supreme Court would find that because it can't be implemented as it is, right. we still need more laws to implement it. Right. We have a provision in law here that you can only have one thing on a bill. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if it requires other bills to enforce this bill, I thought it would fall on that. Well, I, it I, didn't. I kind of think now, now that the court said <clears throat> it can go ahead, that enabling legislation will be important. But what if we can't agree the legislature and governor couldn't come together with a budget two years ago? Um, last year. What are going to happen if nothing happens then? I mean, does our whole election get put on hold until we do it? I mean, Or a bill will pass and it'll be vetoed. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is this effective or not effective? Right. You know, I, it's I, a I think it's scary irresponsible process. to, the way they're saying it is, hey, well, we didn't pass the law, so we'll put it into the Constitution. And by framing it a certain way, they can, they can largely help direct the outcome of it because most and people think it sounds reasonable they think everybody's got a driver's license well and of course this is not something that belongs in a right. constitution yeah. it's I mean, not what a constitution is supposed to provide photography of 20 years ago photo ids photography was a totally different world than it is now who knows what we're going to have available in the future but i mean for for a non-problem i mean one case in 50 years is not a big problem the biggest problem if you want to talk about unfair elections it's the role of money in politics which we talked about earlier but in this case we're going to spend all this money to do something no it's clearly designed it is designed to deny people the ability to vote people who have been voting in the past seniors students um, people who are out of town it's been enabling them to vote and and most people say everybody's got a driver's license but you know I'll bet you even if it's only one in a hundred people or one in a thousand people who have their purse snatched or their wallet stolen or they just misplaced their driver's license, if that happens any time in October, you can't possibly get a new driver's license in time to vote. That's right. That's right. Now, moving on to something yes. else. You have been a champion in the healthcare field. You introduced a bill this year to provide single payer health care in this state, which 138 other industrial industrialized countries have and use for their citizens in different forms but it's single-payer health care takes the insurance companies out of the equation in some countries where the insurance companies are in the equation they're not manipulating the fees the majority leader in the Senate would not even bring that bill to the floor for discussion yeah we've we've been frustrated the uh, our Minnesota health plan the way I describe the bill, it's, it's removing health insurance and just delivering health care directly. We spend twice what any other country in the world spends on health care, and our outcomes are not better. I mean, and we we're 37th yeah, in we're terms of results. We're in terms of results and quality, life expectancy, infant <laughs> mortality, and so on. And so, you know, most people, the idea that we provide health care directly makes great sense. 
and when you save money doing it, great, great idea. But um, you know, Talk the insurance about industry trillion, doesn't like it. Trillion dollar deficits, yeah. but think of the trillions we could save yeah. by single payer. And and I don't usually use the term single payer, not because there's anything wrong, but so many people they they don't know what it is. They know that it's either a good thing or a bad thing. So I just describe it as yeah. A single a system, a system that makes sense for health care. Medicare and, for all. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it because people understand Medicare. They would, ha they would hate to have that taken away. And the other analogy I give to it to under explain how it would work, or the difference is I think health care should be treated the same as any other public service, police, fire, schools, etc. Things you don't have to qualify for. If you go home tonight and find your homes being burglarized, you call 911, and anywhere in the state, the one thing you will not hear from the police or sheriff's dispatcher is, do you have police insurance? And does your policy cover home burglary? And how are you going to pay the deductible? They don't ask those questions. They come and they help you. They address the problem. And to me, a healthcare system that does the same when it saves money, and the most important thing, it keeps people healthier by doing the preventive health care and helping people move forward in the right way. Now, last month, you wrote an article in the Minnesota Post about job creation. And pretty much you said you proposed a strategy that works to create jobs, to put all these people back to work who are not working. Right. Let's talk about that sure. for a moment. I, I think that's a key issue. I mean, the presidential race, because the economy, the presidential race is heavily focused on the jobs issue. And to me, government has an important role and we can learn from history. We can learn from what the economics of the past have taught us. There are things are always changing, but there's some things we can learn from. The 1930s in the depths of the depression, federal government stepped in and they built more public infrastructure during the depression than they had done ever before and it was the most intensive building period. I mean, you look at, you go down to Minnehaha Park and Minnehaha Falls and all the park pavilions there, those were built during, by the WPA or the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression. Bridges, courthouses, schools, waste, um, wastewater treatment plants. This was built at a time when the nation had no money. Why? The federal government stepped in and they said, you know, all these things need doing, all these people are out of work, let's put two and two together and have them do it. We benefited for that for 80 some years now. And we're unwilling to, unwilling to repeat that. And to me, when you look at the public infrastructure, you look at the and schools in Minnesota, bridges. Um, we we should certainly have had our tragedy with bridges, yeah. but even Dwight Eisenhower, Mm -hmm. um, who probably would be drummed out of the Republican You're Party right, today. You wouldn't qualify as a Republican anymore. Built the interstate highway mm -hmm. system, the, the system that really enables us to traverse this country in, in such a really good fashion right, right. Uh, it, and it, safe. It's exactly right. We should be doing, and, and frankly, you know, investing in rehabbing our public buildings to make sure they're energy efficient. What's that do? It takes Minnesota jobs, Minnesota resources, and invests in that so we stop spending money for foreign oil or Texas natural gas or coal, um, making our buildings, our infrastructure more efficient. Um, it's better. Kids will learn better if they have good school facilities. And, and, but in, unfortunately, in politics, the only things that seem to get there are big corporate subsidies. They get a lot of traction and um, money from lobbyists. Money from yeah, which yes. is an interesting thing because you also sponsored a bill about gifts from lobbyists, mm -hmm. and to that's me, a, that's a while back. Right, right. It, 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 that's become law. I wish we could go further and stop campaign contributions from lobbyists and special interests and everything. Um, the Supreme Court won't let us now, which means I think we have to amend the Constitution to fix that so we can get back to democracy. But yes. Lobbyists, I don't care. I mean, they say that lobbying is part of democracy. Any people should be able to go as individuals or a group of people to get together and petition government for the changes they want. I have no objection to that. What I have objection to is these powerful interests with a lot of money hire all these professional lobbyists. Those lobbyists are able to write us a check, right? The politicians, the people they're trying to influence, they're able to write them a check. They used to be able to wine and dine them and everything else, but they can still write checks. 
And the example I give, and it's a hot issue, it was a hot issue in Minnesota uh, a few months ago, um, is with the Viking Stadium. Mr. Wilf made generous campaign contributions to both parties, to politicians, to both politicians running against each other. They give money to both ultimately sides. voted for the stadium, yeah. which you did not. Right. And, and I keep thinking, what if we what use... What did you do with all the money Wilk gave you? <laughs> I didn't get any. I don't take that. <laughs> I don't take Packer lobbyist money. But what if he tried, take another realm that Wilf is familiar with, NFL football. What if before the next Packer game, he gave just little contributions, 1000 bucks or 1500 bucks or whatever the officials before the game? You think the league would stand for that? You think the fans would stand for it? They say, no way. We're not going to sit here and wait and watch to see if those officials throw the game to the Vikings. But now we have substitute officials, so it might work right now. It might. Who knows? <laughs> but, but they're not allowed to because it's an obvious conflict of interest. And if it's important in a football game to have a fair playing field, why can't we have the same fair playing field in government? That's where billions, literally billions of dollars are spent. It's and just another example of how big money gets results You're right and the majority of people in this state uh, and i really didn't have a position one way or the other mm -hmm. i was active and in, in fighting for the twin stadium mm -hmm. um, but uh, in but terms of the vikings i would say the majority of people were opposed yeah. to a viking stadium now i understand that it brings business and i understand mm -hmm. that it brings prestige and i understand all these other things but well, as you pointed a debate on those arguments without the big money behind as you it. pointed out mm -hmm. Uh, before we went on air that the worth of the Vikings when the stadium was approved went up by hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars. Mr. Wilf was making money. The Sports Facilities Commission had a couple of months ago, before the thing happened said the, the whole reason we're doing this is so the team can make money. Well he had he's made now 400 million in capital gains on his 600 million dollar investment in just five or six years. He's made operating profits year after year. Only one exception did he not, one year he did not make any operating profits. Every other year he's made profits. Now under this new stadium, even before it's built, the team's value goes up because they know when it is built, the profits are going to just shoot through the roof. It, it comes back to the greed principle mm -hmm. for these multi-million and billionaires is how much is enough? Mm -hmm. How much is enough? Yeah when people are starving? How much is enough when 47 or 50 million people are uninsured? How much is enough when right. millions of kids go to bed hungry at night exactly. without sufficient food? Exactly. The NFL team owners are now becoming not the one percent, but the one hundredth of one percent wealthiest Americans. They're all, they're becoming the top three, four hundred wealthiest people in the country. The team owners are all falling into that category. This is truly Robin Hood in reverse, where ordinary people are paying money to subsidize not the wealthy, but the billionaires. The Uber Senator Uber. John Marty, we have actually run through our time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Al. Thanks a lot. Okay.